so much for sharing uh, where everyone's comfortable. I agree so much with the water, the living room spaces. Um, um, and also, I definitely like the hair shop. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Let's get this set up so that we can chat. Okay, I think I did it. Uh, yep, we can see it. Okay. Yes, we can see it. All right, awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to be at Ujima Wednesdays. Um, Ujima Boston's a really, I'm a fangirl of you all's work. Uh, during my grad school time, we got to hear a lot about you all's work. Um, and so just really want to thank you for welcoming me into this space and also allowing me to talk about Black space um, and the collective that we've become over the last nine years, which feels crazy to say. Uh, so I'm going to move us forward with just a quick introduction about myself and how I came here um, to be in front of you all. I use the she series in terms of my pronouns. Um, all of my grandparents are from North Carolina. Um, I'm an urban planner and that is kind of like how I've been schooled. Um, but I definitely feel like my education has come from my community. So my North Carolinian roots, and then also um, being a daughter of a teacher, a farmer and an engineer. And all three of those folks have raised me in a way um, to make me think about the world differently. And this photo I share with you all is the street um, Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. This is behind UCLA. Um, I'm from Southern California, went to UCLA for my undergrad time. Didn't know what urban planning was at all when I got to UCLA. Um, but by that time I left, I had figured it out um, all because of this bus stop. Um, I had a lot of questions. LA was my first time living in a bigger city. I'm from like a smaller suburb in Southern California um, called Rialto. So shout out to Rialto. Um, but the bus stops, not have the sidewalks, not having um, a place for people to walk and the bus stop looking like not having seats, not having like a space for people to be covered by rain all made me question a lot because these these bus stops were in the back of UCLA's campus, whereas the front of UCLA's campus um, actually had all of these like fixings and nice digital signs and all this stuff. Um, and it really was confusing to me because the back of UCLA's campus is also the entrance to Bel Air. Um, the Bel Air that we see on Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Um, so like high multi-million dollar homes and folks had a lot of sometimes domestic workers working there. And so those are the folks that use these buses often or students that were going into um, uh, LA, uh, some. It farther into LA. Um, and so these bus stops are why I started Googling like what resources get put where and how I found what urban planning was. Um, so it's definitely, I think it's very important for all, all of us to always ask questions and be curious about our built environment. And I think it's beautiful that we know the places that we are um, comfortable in and why we're comfortable there. And that those kind of like knowings that we have in our kind of lived experience allow our curiosity um, around why some places make us uncomfortable and what's happening there and how can we change that. I think um, that's a, how we want to move ourselves um, in thinking about that. So now I'm going to jump in to talk a little bit about Black space um, and where we kind of came from. So I wanted to start with just this like kind of excerpt of a quote from Mabel O. Wilson. She's one of our favorite Black architects, um, and she made this statement that landscapes are not neutral. And we couldn't, um, so many of us at the time as like Black space was starting to um, develop into something, we couldn't agree with her more. Um, and I think James gave a beautiful introduction to kind of why Ujima um, Project is interested in talking about um, Black world and also thinking about how the fields of urban planning, architecture, public art, all of these different urbanist fields um, and the built environments and spaces around us, um, they impact us. They can make decisions about our life outcomes. Um, people can, you know, make predictions about people's um, uh, life expectancy based off the zip code that they are raised in. And if we think about it that way, we really can understand what Mabel Wilson was saying here about landscapes not being neutral. And so knowing all of that, um, a few of us that started um, the Black Space um, kind of conversations, at that time, it was back in 2015, um, we were looking and really um, just asking ourselves, okay, why does this field of urban planning or this field of architecture um, or this field of, of um, you know, public art feel so white, you know, when we're living in New York, which is like super diverse, one of the most diverse cities in the, in the nation. And then we looked at the numbers and we're like, okay, this is exactly why, um, because we're looking, we're in a, a place that has 23% Black people, but 13% of us are urban planners. And over the years, we've started to look at those numbers at a national um, scale. 
And, you know, there's 12% of the U.S. Um, is Black, yet we represent 2% of architects, 5% of designers, and 6% of urban planners. And those are numbers that just let us know that the people building public spaces don't reflect our nation um, or the cities within it. And so that really um, stuck with a lot of us. And we decided that um, those feelings of sometimes being stifled or isolated were not things that we needed to keep inside, but instead stuff that we wanted to share with each other. Because what came through those feelings and starting to build community around those um, feelings was this um, uh, kind of space of understanding that we had knowings, we had dreams, and we had reimaginings of the way that urbanism um, and fields like, um, you know, design and urban planning um, and, uh, you know, landscape architecture could be done differently. And it could be done in a way that centers Black people, Black liberation, and Black joy. Um, and we figured this out on couches, on chairs, in each other's Brooklyn um, uh, living rooms. Uh, so thinking about physical spaces that made us a uh, feel comfortable, often creating circles um, with our bodies, often uh, bringing potlucked food and having um, vent sessions and dream um, sessions with each other. And uh, we kind of crack up sometimes about this photo because it's a little dusty, but it's like, this is what's our beginnings. Um, you know, folks just like kind of, we knew to archive, I think it's beautiful that you all know to record your sessions and things like that. And I think as we were starting, we're like, okay, we should take pictures of each other um, and these spaces that we're having because we were being able to reimagine the world. Um, and it was a beautiful experience. And from that, um, starting in 2015, in 2019, we were able to formally become a nonprofit. Um, but before we became that nonprofit in those um, smaller um, kind of uh, Brooklyn uh, living rooms, before we got to these crisp, clear photos uh, that we have now, we made this vision. Um, and we decided that we wanted to see a present and future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture mattered and thrived. Um, matter and thrive. And the reason we wanted to see that is because we were in working in, you know, some of us working in government, some of us are working in private um, planning and architecture firms. Um, and some of us were even starting to think about, okay, what would it be like to work on my own, but not clear about what it, what that would look like. But we knew we wanted the world to look a certain way. And we wanted it to look a way where um, Black culture, Black people, Black spaces were really, um, uh, focused on and also invested in in the way that they deserve. Um, so then we continued, you know, as we started in Brooklyn, um, we just continued to kind of build our um, message and also become really clear. And those other urbanists in uh, national cities of Oklahoma, Chicago, and Indianapolis came to us and said, hey, we want to start thinking about um, the same kind of thinkings. Um, and we want to start kind of dreaming, inventing with each other and building space. So we have volunteer groups that operate um, nationally in these cities um, to create space similar to what we're doing today of like being able to dream, imagine with each other um, and think about um, ways to center Black liberation and joy in urbanist practice. And one of the biggest things that we did those first few years with each other um, was build out the Black Space Manifesto. And so I want to take a moment to um, have us kind of uh, think and talk about the manifesto. Um, one of the first things I want to kind of mention is this manifesto came through a year of conversations um, in those Brooklyn apartments. So this was probably like 2017-ish, uh, 18 um, is where we're starting. We've named ourselves. We're getting clear about what we would like to, how we would like to show up in the world. And it became very clear to us. Um, uh, Jennifer Allen, one of our founding members, made it very clear, you know, hey, y'all, we should name like how we want our values and how we want to show up. Um, and so we took over a year speaking with each other and starting to clarify our language and getting really clear about what were our values, what did they mean to us, and how did we want to um, offer them to the world. And so the manifesto, that is how the manifesto came together. Um, there are 14 different principles. I would love to have people... Um, I think I'm going to hold on this so that with time, I want to let us have time for questions and stuff like that. But so out loud, I just want to say some of the principles, um, create circles, not lines, choose critical connections over critical mass, um, move at the speed of trust, be humble learners who practice deep listening, um, celebrate, catalyze, and amplify Black joy, plan, plan with, design with, seek people at the margins, Center lived experience, reckon with the past to build the future, 
protect and strengthen culture, cultivate wealth, foster personal com and communal evolution, manifest the future, and promote excellence. And there should be a link in the chat in case folks want to down, um, download the manifesto. We have it for free on our website. Um, print it, put it up in your bedrooms, where in your, in your spaces of office, your art, your art spaces. We hope that it can um, be a centering space for how you operationalize um, your practice and values in your practice, particularly. And so um, I want to take some time to talk about the manifesto in practice and let that be the focus um, before we open up to questions. Um, to think about, you know, when we're building independent Black spaces, some of the questions that popped up in my head are thinking about how do we make money, how do we spend our time, and who do we serve? And so I want to use the manifesto principles um, to kind of enlighten you and share a little bit about how Black space does this work. Um, as a nonprofit, um, it is kind of difficult to deal with the, you know, the first question of like, how do we make money? Uh, so um, we definitely uh, this is kind of a screenshot of our annual report from our last fiscal year. We're about to have a new annual report that'll come out um, toward the end of this year. But I just want to use this as an example of, you know, first of all, putting it forward, we we rely heavily on grants, right? And so that is that kind of really challenges autonomy. And it's something that we kind of have to focus and work through. But one of the principles that we focus on is choosing critical connections over critical mass when we think about that grant revenue. Um, and I'll, I'm going to speak about that a little bit on the next slide. Before I move, I want to speak to, um, it's also been very important for us uh, to find ways to have our own sources of income. So when we introduced the manifesto, folks started asking, you know, yo, this is dope. How do we apply? How do we use this? Um, how do you want us to, you know, use this in the world? So we created some workshops um, that allow us to share that with people and sharing how people can operationalize this in their practices, both, um, you know, as their team dynamics or how their project plans work, but then also thinking about physical design. Um, what does it look like to build a space uh, that allows critical connection physically? Are there um, different design elements that you can create to um, elicit feelings of trust between people? And we've we've uh, found that the answer is yes to that and had beautiful speculative design workshops with folks over the years. Um, we do those on a sliding scale um, as fee-for-service workshops, and that allows us um, to get that 11% of program revenue that we're able to bring in. Um, in addition to that, we um, do subsidize, we have a subsidized charge to folks that we do um, projects with. And so I'll talk a little bit about our projects in a, in a minute as well. Uh, the next piece I wanted to speak on this choosing critical connections over critical mass is our um, ethics policy. And I think there'll be a link to that dropped in the chat as well for folks um, for you to you know check out. As we were building as a nonprofit and realizing, OK, yeah, this grant game is really something we're going to have to um you know, uh, balance because even in the law, once you decide to be a nonprofit, um, you are, there are a lot of different ways um, that you are tied with the philanthropy circuit and you can't um, completely build like the independence that we might want to naturally kind of jump to. Um, but there are still ways for us to make sure that we have autonomy in the way that we work. And so with the ethics policy that we were able to develop in the last few years, it allowed us to put on paper what we had put in practice over, over some time. And so one of the biggest things um, we're thinking about where were, where were philanthropic dollars coming from? Um, and so I don't have all the screenshots of this. I hope you all are able to access the link to the policy. Um, some of the places that we want to think about is if this philanthropic organization at all has caused harm to Black communities, right? And we mean that in a broad way, right? Are there, is there... Are they um, build? Is their investment portfolio um, invested in in private prisons at all? Um, are there any types of? Um, if it's a bank, are they have they been an, it, done anything with subprime um, mortgages or any type of redlining or loan um, distribution? How have they um, distributed money with people in the past? And has there been anything that's harmed Black folks? The answer to most philanthropic dollars is going to be an easy yes. <laughs> so we've then had to ask ourselves, okay. If the organization knows about this, have they been communicated and made it public? 
And have they built out a kind of plan to restore their, their kind of trust with our community? Um, and that is what allows us to then say, okay, we can start to, you know, build trust and build a relationship with an organization. Um, outside of having these kind of ideas of where we just say no, which we've actually put into practice, we've been offered offered dollars and then looked in um, looked into an organization or a philanthropic um, entity and then realized we cannot take this money. And so um, that moment I think was really big for us and is why we um, actually got to put this on paper uh, because it caused tension in our organization. There were folks that were like, yo, as a as a you know black small black nonprofit, we can't say no to funding. Um, and then there were folks that also you know felt very grounded with we are a principled organization, and it's one of our um, it is our grounding to stand on this manifesto and make sure that we are operationalizing it and making it very clear that you can run um, with your values and still succeed. And so um, through those tough kind of conversations is the way that this policy actually got written out. And then a um, last piece I want to bring up about this is um, we have written words in there that kind of guide us around an annual review of our donors. And so um, I think there's so much as a nonprofit where you're getting, you have to report to your funders um, and they're getting to kind of like uh, critically look at your programming, your impacts and all of these pieces. We decided to kind of turn the, turn that on its head a little bit and, and want to ask questions about folks that are funding us. Like, how are they showing up for us? Are they connecting us to other money? And we all know that there is I, I can't say the, the percentage, but it's a very small number of the all of the philanthropic dollars that go out um, annually. It's a very small number of that that goes to black led nonprofits. And so knowing that and that being very um, well known data in the philanthropic community, if we don't have um, philanthropic funders who are then connecting us to the next funder, then you're not really showing up for us. Right. And so and then we also want to make sure that folks are make, not making it hard for us on a reporting side are, you know, there's a lot of trust based um, philanthropy that's starting to build up. And some of those folks are making their reporting be a lot more conversational, also making their reporting, meaning them coming out out of their offices and looking at our projects versus us having to write reports um, for them to share with their board. So please dig into this policy. Also, if you all are part of organizations that have policies, we're nerds, we'd love to see it um, and be able to like build from that. Um, another piece I wanna talk about is how do we spend our time? Um, in terms of our time, one of the uh, big things that came up for us very early on, um, I, I'm co I co-manage um, uh, I co-manage the organization with Emma Osore, um, who is um, another founding member of Black Space. And when we came in at the end of 2020, it was our first time being full-time, you know, Black Space hiring full-time staff and hiring us to co-lead the organization. We made a decision that we were going to run on a four-day work week. Um, the four-day work week is really important for us as Black women, um, particularly because so much time has been stolen from us, um, stolen from us from just stolen from black people and um, particularly black women um, systematically and also in a personal like day-to-day -day, um, kind of interactions. And then when we decided to do this four day work week, we then wanted to make sure it was super clear that we didn't mean 10 hour days. So that also means that black space runs on a 32 hour work um, cycle. So that's what we're putting on timesheets. That's what staff is held accountable to so that people can actually um, think about and build out their their lives. People have other, there's other ways of like building knowledge and becoming um, a stronger practitioner. And this is where we try to think about lived experience and letting that guide kind of our work. And so we knew you know, from the time that we had been um, professionals in other in other uh, roles, that the five day work week was not working for us, and so we wanted to try something different while we were able to um, be in leadership positions. And so we've been doing that now, coming up on five years, and it's okay. Like the organization's functioning, um, it is hard sometimes, and there are days where you know there's times where we're doing weekend events, um, and when we, and what we have been able to come and develop with that is comp time and realizing like just because there's a weekend event doesn't mean people have to jump back into work on Monday. And so all of that's been really important to us to check ourselves because I think all of us are operate, oper, operating 
in capitalism in a way that it can make us um, forget that we're not just tools and we aren't just like um, supposed to work and work and work. And instead we have to put parameters and guidelines on ourselves. Um, and so that's been very important to us. Another thing about how we spend our time is in collective. Um, this has over uh, with between quarantine, also with having national entities, um, it's been really difficult for us to go back to those same days of being on the Brooklyn couches. Um, but we know that sharing each other's kind of lived experience and being able to um, feel that community of, you know, that happened to me in the this meeting too. Like, yeah, I was the one black person um, in this meeting talking about a black neighborhood and folks had those same kind of energies and I had to push back on this or feeling like isolated um, in any of those ways. We know that we built a lot of power, community and confidence um, as a collective, but then also as individuals that make up that collective by being in community. And then we also knew that we as an organization um, uh, the hive mind is how we have been able to uh, succeed. When we have issues, we often bring it to the bigger collective um, as much as we can. Um, it's definitely gotten harder over the years, but this image is from our collective convening that we held in Chicago in May. Um, and we're having our next one next May in um, Oklahoma. And so these are our different cousin cities where we're now getting to you know use our resources, use our time, to be able to gather people nationally with each other. And it's been super exciting and very generative for us. Um, and so this was important for us because we have new programming that we're thinking about now. And we were able to think about that over a year in virtual community with our folks, but then come to some final decisions with each other last May, which was really, really exciting to be in person um, to do that. And then uh, what that means is when we think about, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't put up our structure. Uh, we operate in four circles. So we have a circle that's our board. Those are volunteers that focus on our um, governance um, and our financial kind of oversight. We have what we call our hired support. So those are folks like myself who get paid either on a full-time employee um, structure. There's five of us. And then we have project partners who are contractors that are 1099 and they um oper they facilitate our workshops um that are those fee for service workshops I mentioned and they also lean into some of our um, neighborhood strategy projects that I'll mention. Um, and then our third circle is our cousins. Those are those groups in Oklahoma, Indianapolis, and Chicago. Those are volunteers that are creating physical space um, and like community experiences for folks to explore black spaces in their neighborhoods. Um, and then lastly, we have our alumni um, who are folks who have been a part of any of those circles um, and then still want to be a part of the collective in a more passive capacity. So bringing those folks together um, has been super, super um, critical to us continuing to have independence because that collective hive um, uh, mindset and also the resources we can bring one another um, allows us to not have to rely on, on kind of like outside folks. Uh, the last piece I want to talk to before opening space to um, questions is this uh, question of who do we serve? Um, and so as a nonprofit, we're a public good. Um, and so we want to, but then we know that in our manifesto and our whole focus and our vision, right, that thinking about Black culture, um, Black spaces and Black people that um, being able to matter and thrive in the present and in the future, um, that like kind of reclaiming of our work and our focus um, stays in our vision. Our mission is focused around creating um, opportunities for Black urbanists to create spatial change with Black communities. And so that is, um, I want to talk about our neighborhood strategy projects. Um, and so those projects we exclusively do with community-based organizations that are Black-led, um, we also do these at a very small scale. So we do about one to two of these projects a year um, because we go all the way in with folks. Um, and so in Brownsville, we started with a larger kind of like neighborhood wide project around heritage conservation. And through that, we were able to map a lot of heritage spaces um, in Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, and be able to through interviews hear one on one kind of uh, recounts and archival, like some oral history about 
where were celebrations? Where are the neighborhood spots? Um, where are places of worship? Where are people's fondest memories of culture? Where did folks like um, really gain an, an idea of like loving that they were black? Um, where are the places on the maps that meant this? Um, by collecting those stories, we were able to then find out there were a number of different cultural workers um, and cultural producers in, black, um, in Brownsville. And through um, identifying those folks, we were able to bring them together, um, start to kind of have our same kind of brunch session, but bringing them with each other to connect folks that are working on the east side of Brownsville with folks working on the west side of Brownsville. Um, again, always, I think a big uh, theme that you'll hear from us is we often want to bring people into circles with each other to create micro black networks. Um, you know, it's very important that we are able to like create ecosystems um, and then connect with each other as like black communities so that we can um, uh, really build our own autonomous ideas of like what the way that we want our neighborhood to look. So for example, in Brownsville, there's a lot of non-black, non-Brownsville written history about what Brownsville's culture and history is about and heritage about. And so uh, mapping this was kind of our way of trying to articulate and start to show an offering of like, there are a lot more stories from the actual community members um, that could be told, that could be published. Um, through this project, we ended up working. There's a piece of this that it's important for us to um, uh, think about like other uh, other makings throughout a project for us. So one is this uh, heritage book, um, this heritage playbook, which is on our website, free for download. Um, that is something that allowed us to synthesize our process with the Brownsville community, but then also offer folks like just the beginning of how to start um, heritage conservation work in your neighborhood at a local level. Um, we really wanted to think also about the fact that um, there are cultural producers that just needed support and like needed resources right then in the moment. So we found, um, you know, that there was a Brownsville writing uh, club called uh, Power in the Pen. And they had numerous like Brownsville authors that wanted to publish. And so we worked with some folks in our um, network and our collective that are graphic designers. And they worked with them to get this, like their anthology up and like created. And from that, Power in the Pen was able to start to gather some revenue through like they sell this on Amazon, they sell it at some of their um, their events. And sometimes I think our projects, we have to allow ourselves to uh, move at the speed of trust, move at the speed of trust because it allows like new ideas to kind of emerge. You might not think a group of urban planners and architects are going to be working with a neighborhood on a uh, um, a writing anthology, but we did, and it really mattered and added so much to, um, you know, our experience in the project and also to what the neighborhood was asking for at that time. Um, the last thing I'll mention is um, this work turned into, from that map and from those conversations and little makings with cultural producers, we ended up starting a three-year project with Brownsville Heritage House. Um, and they were a part of that, you know, cultural producer group that we spoke with. I think this project was something that really um, helped us grow in so many different ways. So this is a black led community archive space. They've been around for over 40 years um, now. They were started by a woman named um, Mother Rosetta, Rosetta Gaston, who out of her home started to open up um, a children's library for black kids, black and brown kids in the neighborhood to learn about their history because it wasn't being taught in public schools. Um, from that, she was able to, um, as an avid community advocate, as a lot of Black women in neighborhoods are, um, she actually worked and got space at the top of the Children's Library that was opening um, in Brownsville. And so the, the day that the first Children's Library actually in the nation, um, but also the Brownsville um, Brownsville's first Children's Library, when it opened, it opened and the second floor of it was given to Brownsville Heritage House to operate its um, um, space. And so now 40 years later, um, there's been 40 years of um, different Black ma maternal leadership in that organization. There's also been 40 years of archiving. So as people have passed away, as people have moved out of Brownsville, people have moved in, they sometimes bring some of their family's um, trinkets or artists have like made objects uh, for the space. 
um, or, you know, um, also like newspapers have been collected and jet magazines, even um, Rosetta Gaston herself had a beautiful archive that when she passed away um, a little bit before Brownsville um, Heritage House actually opened in the library, she dedicated her archive to the space. And so um, we were able to work for three years with them to set up a design um, strategy, which meant, you know, doing things like this of mapping out their physical space and starting to name what did they want to do? What were some of the assets? How could it be used? What were some considerations? We then also like formalized an archive with them. Um, there was, you know, 40 years of aunties bringing space, bringing things to space did not always mean them labeling everything. So we I worked with a team of Black archivists um, that were able to come in and kind of set up systems um, for BHH and really create a space for now. They are um, able to host and share their archive in a whole different way. And then the last piece that we did was, which is really new for us, we do a lot of design projects, but we don't do build projects. And so this project was really exciting for us because we took this last, um, this back room here um, is called the reading room. It has, they have community meetings there, um, but now it also holds a lot of their um, archive material and in a way that is super presentable to folks. And I'm thinking, oh shoot, I don't have a picture of this, okay. Um, I'll drop a link uh, when we're in the questions to our IG page so that you all can see um, a video of kind of what the redesign looked like. So from this design strategy, we created recommendations. Um, those recommendations we brought to life in this physical room. And the vibe there that folks wanted for BHH was to recreate an auntie's living room because that's what BHH started from and has been kind of its home. And so it's been really incredible to work with um, Mary Robertson, the executive director there over the past three years to bring this to life. Um, and so I'll end with just, you know, stating um, I'm not going to go over this project in Red Hook, but you can see, check this out on our website, Walcott Street Farm. Here we did um, an urban uh, design, redesign of an urban farm, which they then built out themselves. They're another Black-led organization in Brooklyn. Um, but lastly, I want to say... Um, that it is important when we're thinking about uh, Black independence that we think about it in a multitude of ways. And so for us, we're a urban planning and urban design nonprofit that gathers folks, does projects with Black communities, and also is able to share our, our workshops. But there's other ways that folks are building Black independence. So I wanted to shout out these um, just as three things to look into. Um, we have Lauren Hood, who in Detroit is building literally a new index for research and how you can think about like Black um, neighborhoods. I think a lot of times people come at Black neighborhoods with a deficit mindset, and she's offering us a more asset-based research index. Um, the B-Side Creative Campus is in Indianapolis um, and is creating literally a live workspace for artists um, that is black led, black made, and black owned. Um, and then Open Design Collective, another black led um, organization out in Oklahoma, um, is taking a historic uh, black theater from that is like the one remaining site in a black neighborhood that's um, dealt with a lot of uh, not only gentrification, but more, uh, more importantly for them was urban renewal that like really decimated a lot of community. The Jewel Theater is now in being restored um, with a million dollar grant from Mellon with Open Design Collective. So dropping those things in the, the chat, hope you all check those out and I wanna leave space for questions. I'm proud of myself, I did this in 30 minutes. <laughs> perfect, perfect, thank you, thank you. Everybody let's give a round of applause. You can turn the lights off for me real quick. Perfect. Yeah, let's open it up for questions. Um, we have around like 12 minutes. So yeah, let's anyone who has a question, feel free to raise your hand virtually and then we can jump to in person if need be. I had a quick question about the iconography that was attached to the um the um in the manifesto. I was just curious to know. Um, sort of, uh, is there, is there, like, where did it come from? Any stories behind them? Are they attached to sort of the, those a specific sort of uh, principles or are, are like connected to them in some way? So I'm just curious. Yes, um, we definitely, um, one of the 
the big things that we were, um, we had a lot of different design precedent that we came together to like look at. One of those things being indinkra symbols. There were also kind of um, uh, folks had different shapes that, you know, brought manifested different feelings for them. Um, and then we worked with a black designer um, who was able to bring it all together and kind of understand what we were trying to move in terms of, yes, each one of the uh, symbols actually should be speaking to um, the principle it's with. So like you can see some, you know, for here, there's an imagery in Cultivate Wealth of like growing kind of plant-like um, thinking about resources in that way. Um, and then also if you, sorry, another one that I think uh, is easy to see is um, being humble listeners. Um, that one, you know, you should, it, we hope that it elicits an idea of like seeing ears um, and making sure that we're listening. So there is some literal, but it's a little bit abstract and poetic, of course, um, but definitely uh, we're able to have a lot of visual sessions um, with each other and then bring that to a designer. Thank you. Uh, no, I've got, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I know we had one comment in person. Yeah, I run a nonprofit as well. Yeah, let me get closer. Uh, the comfy seat. <laughs> um, so um, I run a nonprofit um, here in Boston, and I also um, specialize in redlining urban renewal, as well as cultural health development. Um, and I wanted to know um, how does one reach out or I, um, I'm i doing um, Black History Month event series in February. The Boston Red Line map was issued February 1st, 1938. So um, I like to be very proud that I have found that little niche that is also the beginning of Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about, so I have a bunch of events, so I would like to reach out to you guys guys and parts that oh yeah i can drop in the chat our, on our website you can um we have a contact us page where you can say like if you're interested in workshops or, or what you're interested in but contact at blackspace.org is just an easy way to contact us drop it in the chat all right thank you thank you thank and you. for that tidbit about every person Any other questions virtually? Feel free to drop them in the chat too. Well, okay, I can ask one. I can ask one more question. Nobody has one. I didn't want to hold up the time. Yeah, feel free to come back. Um, what historic, like the historical data that you are um, studying in regards to the communities prior to urban renewal, what are, what are the major factors that you look at um, there and how does that, um, how does that translate to your work now? Sorry, you said for urban renewal projects, what's the, what are the major? No, prior to urban renewal, the communities that existed in those spaces then, what parameters do you focus in on, uh, you know, like what demographics or what, you know, just what data do you look at and how does that translate to your work that you do now? Oh, okay. Understand. So we haven't done a project really focused around a site that's um, uh, been either like, you know, we could talk about Friedman's uh, spaces. Um, we can also, you know, or someone like the Jewel Theater, which is like was a victim of a lot of urban renewal, but was a independent black um, space before. Our partners, Black Space Oklahoma, they've been a part of this, that open design collective project. Um, and so they have done a lot of work because Oklahoma has such a rich history in black free towns. And so I think that's always been our anchor. Whenever we think about, you know, before urban renewal, before um, gentrification, before any of these big systematic um, kind of like attacks on black community, what existed before. I think these examples of like black free towns in states like Oklahoma, where I think the number is 50, there were 50 black free towns before Oklahoma even reached statehood. Um, and then now there are about 13 still existing. And then we have spaces in Brooklyn, such as like Weeksville um, Heritage um, Center, which is on like um, uh, uh, land um, a free of a free town. So I think those kind of spaces are what we always look 
um, look at to reckon with the idea that Black people have been planners, architects, and builders of spaces, and they have logics. We've had logics about what resources we wanted where, and even the order that we design cities. And so I think those are always kind of what we are able to um, rely on. And I want to, there's someone named uh, Andrea that works out of Texas. She's doing a lot, and she actually has built a data set for um, uh, free towns, I think, particularly in the Texas area. I will try to find her and drop her in the chat. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, and Thank then I you. like I I'm doing my own like just genealogy work like that. That'll be my plug. I think every black person, especially I think everyone. I think I have an experience as a person that's a descendant of um people that were enslaved in the U.S. I think all of us have to do the work of our genealogy, and I don't so much um mean like you know submitting your dna to to folks if you're not comfortable with that i mean like you know starting to figure out where's mom from where's dad from where's grandpa from where's grand great grandfather from and starting to build that because a lot of our our roots um come from our our folks living in these free towns i found out that my own like family has been a part of a um a free town and i think that just adds to our own kind of like confidence again in space making this is my thank you, but there is a, a signal. Somebody in the chat, I think, asked about archival alchemy. I saw that in the chat. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, thank you for naming them. Um, Archival Alchemy is a Black um, archivist group um, out of Brooklyn, or they're actually out of Harlem, but out of New York. And yes, we did work with them on the Brownsville Project. It was incredible. Um, Joyce is the founder of that. I can't remember Joyce's last name right now. Are y'all salary hourly based for? Yes. So our five full-time employees are um, salaried. And then we have a number, our project partners is probably that do the workshops. Those are 1099 contractors. And those folks are, it's about 14 of those. Thank you, Claudia. Yes. Joyce Leanne Joseph, incredible, incredible archivist um, out of New York, archival alchemy. Hmm. Good question. Um, climate, uh, we have our last project that we spent the uh, three years on was Brownsville Heritage House. Um, so we, I think we did not work as much there, like uh, about climate change. I think climate change is something that we have been very aware of. And we talked a bit about in that farm um, project that we worked on um, in Red Hook. Um, as we're designing, I think one of the most important things that we've tried to remember is that Black liberation is not like separate and Black and um, justice work is not separate of climate change. Um, it should, you know, the two should be working hand in hand with each other is something that's very important to us. Um, and realizing that a lot of Black communities um, strengthening, per, creating a, like spaces and an argument that a lot of Black communities also um, become like either our uh, firsthand victims um, to like uh, extreme kind of weather issues, just like um, this latest kind of like hurricane, but also when people are um, uh, moved from their homes and relocated, it's often like black communities that become new homes for folks. Um, and so I think that's been something that we're interested in and um, trying to art want to articulate kind of like reason uh, for more resources to be given to these communities because they it's these cultural spaces that become like kind of pseudo um, uh, homes for folks at place in times of emergency. Um, and so I think that kind of connection is what has been a big piece for us um, of like making sure that it's clear that climate and justice is not something, well, you know, racialized like spatial justice is not separate from climate change is like really, really important for us. And then some of our members are more focused, particularly on climate as planners. So I want to shout out um, like Daphne Lundy from our um, collective. She just did a really interesting um, exhibit on heat and particularly um, what uh, kind of heat conditions in prisons. Um, and so I'll drop her name in the chat and I'm going to also try to find a link for that. We do have one more question in person. 
Hi, Kenyatta. Thank you for being with us this evening. I'm Gio. I'm also with the Boston Ujima Project alongside Genoa and others. I use the he, him series. Uh, my question is, I'm good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, uh, my question is, uh, when engaging in the beautiful and radical act of black placemaking, carving out these spaces intentionally, uh, what are what are some uh, common obstacles that are not strictly financial? So what are some common obstacles, maybe on the social, the social emotional side? Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. What, what, are, what are the common things? Uh, we have our own set over here in Boston, but I'm sure, you know, there's some overlap. Um, yes, I, Gio, thank you for that question. I didn't have time to really bring all that up, but I think, um, so thank you for inviting it. There is so much because I think this comes up to like the, uh, when I think about the principle of like uh, reckoning with the past to build the future, um, comes up a lot for me because we've had these projects. Um, I'll talk about Brownsville Heritage House because it's our most recent one. Um, but we've had these projects where we're working with elders. And I think when we're working with elders, it's um very important that there's some, there's like an amount of respect and care given to them that was has not been given to them um by a lot of folks that they've worked with. And so um I think it's been very interesting how to manage that like in a big project. So for example, during the BHH project, there was, I mentioned this thing of formalizing the archive. So there's a number of, I mean, there are thousands of objects in BHH and archival alchemy was incredible in terms of being able to explain to us, okay, what is a formal archive, you know, archive based library? How do you build that? How do you decide the criteria for what fits in it and what doesn't? And so while all of that on paper made sense, the plans made sense, then the days came for like the community days of actually starting to separate what is the formal archive objects and what are objects that can be donated or um, you know given to other organizations because they don't fit the archival mission. Um, and the reality of that was really, really hard. Um, we had, you know, folks that were a part of the community, had been a part of the community for a long time, and um, also staff from BHH that it was emotionally hard to let go of items, um, especially when you feel like you are the keeper, right? And I think in any Black, paste, uh, black space making, you'll see this if you watch the video from, um, I'm jumping projects, but if you watch the video in um, from Oklahoma with the Jewel Theater, uh, the man who um, owns the Jewel Theater right now is an older Black man, and he got the Jewel Theater from its original um, owners, and he made a promise to them about, like, you know, re renovating it. But it, you know, after decades and decades and decades, of, you know, no's, um, false leads, people kind of not working with him in the way that they promised, he's now trying to trust these, this, you know, these younger Black folks to make this work happen. Um, but he also is very real about like he's coming to like you know he's in the um uh he's been living he's lived a long life but he's like I want this to happen before I go right and so there's just this re I think there's a pressure that comes to like getting it right there's also like a pressure of trying to figure out how you're really caring for people um while doing this like physical work and like maybe more technical mapping work and I think that is an easy place to get tripped up on and why we try to take moments of like reflecting midway like we had to have a whole back to the BHH project when we did that that day um when we tried that first community day where we were um separating objects we had to stop and have a whole moment and Joyce really worked with our team um to create um, a new kind of emotional care practice so that uh, Miriam Robertson is, I think care is the way, where I, what I want to say is like the big thing that we have to focus on and make sure that we create time for in our project plans. Like you're not just working on a physical space, you are working with community, you are co-designing, you are co-planning. And so just honoring, this goes back to the, I can keep going on, but I won't. It goes back to these principles, right? Like if you're centering somebody's lived experience, you're not gonna just push, push forward um, to just for the, the 